This is HighIntensityBusiness.com with Lawrence Neal, helping you achieve your health and fitness goals. Become a great personal trainer and build your high-intensity strength training business. This episode is brought to you by the Resistance Exercise Conference. Would you like to learn from the top strength training professionals and researchers, network and connect with other exercise professionals from all over the world, and get inspired, rejuvenated, and focused on your strength training business? I certainly do, and that is why this will be my third appearance at REC. It's my favorite weekend of the year, and I'm so excited to attend again in March 2020. So why else should you attend REC? Well, firstly, there will be keynote presentations from exercise icons like Dr. Bente Klarlin Peterson, Stuart Phillips, PhD, James Fisher, PhD, and Luke Carlson. As a studio owner, you will learn business tactics and strategies on how to grow your business from the CEO of Discover Strength, the highest revenue producing strength training company in the nation. Moreover, you will grow your network by connecting with other strength training business owners from around the world. As a personal trainer, REC will provide you with tangible training techniques to take back to your clients to implement right away for better results. And REC is approved by ACSM, NASM, ACE, and NSCA for continuing education credits. The conference will be held on the 27th and 28th of March 2020 at the gorgeous Graduate Hotel in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Join me and register now over at resistanceexerciseconference.com. If you want to take your strength training business to the next level and build a world-class personal training and business network, you must attend. Please register now over at resistanceexerciseconference.com. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly, and I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done, and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention HIB, that's High Intensity Business, in the How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you place an order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter HIB in the How Did You Hear About Us field. Lawrence Neal here and welcome back to highintensitybusiness.com. This is episode 250. Today's guest is a returning guest, Walter Vendor. Walter is the CEO of the Fit20 Group, overseeing the expansion in the Netherlands and abroad and directing innovation. The first Fit20 studio opened in 2009 and today they have more than 120 studios in the Netherlands and continue to grow internationally. Walter, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you, Lawrence. It's a pleasure to be back. It's a pleasure to to have you again. Did I get the the introduction? Is that accurate, or those numbers grown somewhat since? Well, actually, there's some good news here to report, which is uh, this month we will hit 150 uh, studio. Wow. So that's uh, wow. another uh, uh, nice growth figure after we hit 100 studios in April 2017. We'll hit 150 just this month, and uh, we're aiming to hit the 200 by before half next year. Wow, that's a very impressive. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> so every now and again, Walter, I come across 
or have an epiphany or come across a resource that I think is a real game changer. Um, you know, Luke had mentioned, Luke from Discover Strength had mentioned traction to me a long time ago. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I reached out to Luke and I said, Luke, what would be your your top five reading list for a new hit entrepreneur? And at the yeah. top of that list was traction without even missing yeah. a beat. Um, and I thought, okay, that's interesting. I should probably read that at some point. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then obviously, you know, you, you mentioned it and mentioned doing a podcast, talk about it today. And so I figured, you know, it's time to read it. And, and there's so much value I can get out of it because um, it's, it's becoming very apparent to me that there's so much that I haven't uh, figured out in my own business, in my online business, but also in the studio that my business and partner and I are launching in January. So I'm really happy that I'm now going through this process. So right. Luke's raved on about this book. Um, I know, you know, the perfect workout are, you know, big fans of traction. Um, and so just, you know, opening this book and reading through it, I'm I'm just seeing so much... I'm having so many aha moments, you know, oh, that's yeah. how you figure that out. That's how you run the business. And so it doesn't yes. run you, run you, you know what I mean? So talk to me, how did you, how did you come across it personally? Well, actually through uh, another franchise uh, formula in the US, uh, I think it's called Brightstar. They're in the uh, home market, home and care market. Um, and I read her book and at the end she recommended this book on traction and uh, so I thought well if she's recommending it and she had a very um, very sound franchise organization build up then I thought it's worth for me to have a look at it so uh, I got the book and for me it was the first time when I actually read a whole book on business practice how, how you can actually structure your business in a very comprehensive way where every aspect of the business is covered in a way that is actually simple and that you think, oh yeah, I can implement this. Uh, yeah, I can work with that. Um, so either I found so far that books I read on, on, on management that it's either a partial solution, it addresses a part, or it's getting really very complex. And this was like best of both worlds. It put everything together for me and I thought, let's have a go at this. Yeah, I just, you know, in preparation for this, I was uh, watching a YouTube presentation of an entrepreneur. You may have even seen this this one. He, he, uh, he had a business doing some sort of refrigeration maintenance or, or something like that. Um, but he, he's a serial entrepreneur and he's now an EOS uh, traction implementer. And uh, he said exactly the same thing. He said... He's come across, because we've all come across so many systems and approaches and methods to running and growing a business that it can be so overwhelming and it can be quite disappointing when, you know, that initial burst of motivation, inspiration uh, fizzles out after you realize that, you know, either it's too complex or not appropriate for your business or what have you. Um, And it seems to me, uh, you certainly would seem, you know, having obviously seen organizations in this sector have success with this, that this is a fantastic model. Um, So do you want to just start talking about what it is exactly? What is traction? What is the entrepreneur operating system to give kind of a, a, you know, an introduction to this episode? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think um, they split essentially, uh, for me, the most important thing is that uh, the way they look at the business is on the top end, you've got your vision. And at the bottom, you've got traction. Um, then you've got four other components that make up your business. And, and the good thing is that they, they took best business practices from, from, from all over the place and actually put it together in this one comprehensive view. So essentially, you've got in every business, you need to have a vision. Um, then you need people to um, do, to, to enact upon your vision. Uh, you then start to collect data you will have to organize your processes. Uh, You will bump into issues that you need to fix. And if you get it right, you you get your traction, which is in a way the realization of your vision. Um, So if I think of, and I think this happens to many people who start a business, is first you must have a vision. Um, So whatever type of business you start, if you don't have a vision, um, you, know, you, you can't create a new reality. So any business is at first a proposition. It doesn't exist yet. And the strength of the vision and the clarity of the vision of the entrepreneur um, 
actually is leading. So, so one of the things that fits in the vision path, for instance, is the BHAG. So where will you be 10 years from now? How does your business look like 10 years from now? And then you drill it down to three years and then one year and so on. So that part, actually, uh, I worked out pretty good uh, myself. And I think that is part of the reason why we've been able to get to 150 studios in 10 years time because of the vision. And there are many small companies that don't spend much time on vision. They stay in a way with both feet in the mud. But the problem is if you're with both feet in the mud, you, you never get out of the mud. So you should always try to have one foot out of the mud. And that's your vision foot, I always say. And then the other foot is, is stuck in the traction bit, which is the mud. <laughs> So, so this is how the model for me was very recognizable and, and I was struggling with uh, not so much the vision part in my case, but the traction part. Right. Okay. So shall we, that's an awesome way to start this. Um, you know, what? I'm, 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 I thought it would be quite a good way to do this would be perhaps we could go through the six components that surround your business in the middle um, yeah. and just talk about those a little bit. And then, and then yeah. what I always find really useful is, is, in, is, is emphasizing those with case studies and maybe just not case studies, sorry, but examples. And so, you know, I would love, for instance, Walter, to hear about um, the vision in terms of the Fit20 vision and how you've sort of answered some of those questions. So yeah. I don't know, did you want to start with vision and then kind of sure. go around in a clockwise yeah. fashion? Yeah. Yeah. Vision is fine. So um, I think the first question uh, any entrepreneur needs to ask themselves, why do you exist or why do you want to exist with your business? You know, what, what is your cause uh, or what is your passion? And I think for us uh, to give um, what we came to and even that to drill down your vision in one simple short statement is actually a lot of work and I found is very frustrating which is why many companies uh, never get their vision and their mission statement uh, sharply defined um, and your core values. So it begins with what is your vision, which for us was strength changes everything. So that simple sentence that sums up the reason why we exist. So we literally believe that if the human body is stronger, physically stronger, it's the biggest predictor of your life expectancy. And we also know that most people after 25 don't work out regularly anymore and they begin to actually slide backwards already. And that process of going sliding downhill only gets accelerated the older we get. But it is reversible because you and I know that you can train your skeletal muscles in a number of ways, but high intensity training is the most time efficient manner to do that. So. Um, we spend a lot of time of why do we exist? And, and that's um, because strength changes everything. And we made it our mission um, that we add strength to your life. That's our mission statement. And then our core values, we actually took the time and trouble to work it down to four core values, which define Fit20. And everyone at Fit20, uh, whether it's a franchisor, a master or an employee, they will learn and understand the vision, the mission, and the core values. Uh, so that's something we already knew is important. And I saw that back in, in the approach of EOS with uh, the vision statement, it, it starts with those three things. Um, and they, they don't look very specific yet, but they really are the ground from which you build your organization. And then strategy follows that. So the marketing strategy is then how then, if you've defined this 10-year B-hack or you know, dot on the horizon, um, how will you get there? That's strategy. And 10-year um, strategy is great, but how is the three-year picture and how is the um, shorter term? How will you do that? So I think all of these things are at the vision part. And I... I felt immediately very easy with that part because we'd spent time on it. And I know that many companies don't, but all fast growing companies spend a lot of time on, on clarifying their vision. So that's what I would say on that, Lawrence. 
Awesome. No, just a couple of questions on that. You know, I think it's quite easy for some people to listen to this and think, this is all very well, but isn't it for bigger businesses? And, you know, even when you read Traction, I think like the smaller businesses they talk about are like one, two million dollars annual revenue. Um, But I get a feeling that this is something that you should implement from the very beginning, uh, regardless of the size of your business. Is that correct, do you think? I think so. I think it's for literally uh, a one-person business to a 10 or 20, 50, 100. I think it's relevant for for anyone because uh, even if you start up as a small business and you go to a network uh, event, a business networking event, and you sit next to a person and many times people ask each other, what are you doing? But that's actually not a very interesting question. A a far more interesting question to ask another person is, why are you doing what you're doing? And that's how you connect to their passion and to their drive or their purpose. And then you have a very different type of conversation. And and then you're in the mission, in in the vision part, if we follow the the, the business model of the EOS. A bit of a nitpicky one, but why four values over five? Well, we had four. Um, maybe if I would have come up with five, it would be five. But we, <laughs> we had four. <laughs> I'm also a fan of simplicity. <laughs> so yeah. if four do it, and then you don't necessarily need five. Yeah, less is more. And um, I think we'll come on to this in a moment. But there's a bit yes. in the process where you come up with your your one year goals and your rocks. And I was looking at thinking seven for each of those is a lot. And yeah. uh, I, I personally would be going for, you know, two or three. I, I'm very much a, a, a single tasker type person um, yeah. who gets overwhelmed by if the list is too long. And But we'll come on to that in a moment. One of the things I don't think you mentioned, and maybe I missed it, um, was your niche. What is, how have you defined your niche for Fit20? Well, uh, this is one thing which has uh, changed over time. Um um, I'm still struggling with that because I think when we started, we were still thinking very much in the sphere of uh, personal training. And personal training was actually primarily for people who could financially afford it. And then you end up with a niche market. Uh, but one of the things, and this is, I think, very important to realize for anyone in the hit business, actually we're in the time of what I would call masculinity. So what we're doing is attractive for a mass of people and not just a niche, but the mass consists of niches. And so there is, I think, to the the hit market, a niche for, say, aging people after their retirement who don't want to sit at home and just waiting to die, but still want to enjoy life, go on holidays, play with the grandkids. And they should definitely take a hit. Um, then there is the busy executive who would like to train but doesn't find the hours because you know he's so busy fulfilling a career. Then there is the people with health complaints, of which we've got so many, who have back trouble. And if they just go to a gym and they train workout unsupervised, they can next week go to the physiotherapist. Um, you know because they will injure themselves, and either they will train too light or too heavy. They won't get it right. Uh, without professional supervision. Then you've got the kids of these days who just spent already in their teenage years, they're just already addicted to gaming or they're sitting all day long programming or doing something on on their mobiles, but they're not playing outside anymore as we did when I was a kid. Uh, In Holland, uh, most kids uh, don't go out anymore to play in their teenage years. So then I saw there's actually so many niches that actually uh, all require a different marketing approach. Uh, Before we talk about, for instance, uh, employees uh, who may not be able to, on their own, afford HITS training. But if you organize it, uh, a HITS facility in their company, it becomes available suddenly to many more people. So I think we're talking about the mass market these days that just consists of niches together. Yeah, so in my mind, though, that would be your target market, right, in the marketing strategy bit. But the way I understood our niche in the context of this 
model is right. what you want to be known for, right? So for instance, yeah. um, like what your strength is. So I know that Discover Strength, at least last time I checked in with Luke, it was personalized strength training or something mm. like that. Um, yeah. And that's all they want to be known for. And that is yeah. their core business. Anything that doesn't fit that, they ignore it. You know, They don't really do much in the way of nutrition or anything like that. Yeah. And that that's enables right. them to be more focused and productive. Um, yeah. So have you, does that, I don't know if that helps in terms of reframing my yeah. question, but have you, have you defined that within your organization? Yeah. Well, then I would say, indeed, we also, we had our experience with adding, you know, with uh, supplements and with uh, dietitian and nutrition advice. Uh, we've come back from that. And indeed, we've also said we want to be a specialist in, in what we're good at, which, which is in a way similar which is in our case, we add strength to people's lives. And we can do that uh, in company, we can do that in our own facilities, we can do that uh, for all ages, but that's essentially our niche, we add strength. That's what we're good at. Yeah, yeah. it's uh, it's funny, you know, because when I, when I um, talk to Luke and I learn about everything they're doing at DS and I see how they implement traction um, and other uh, approaches, I'm always like, oh God, it's so tempting to just copy Discover yes. Strength. But I, I know I know that so many people in the high intensity training industry, um, you know, sometimes have that feeling and, uh, and Luke will probably listen to this and he might laugh and hopefully won't be yeah. fearful of that. Um, but um, out of respect yeah. and out of wanting to be original and authentic, I certainly will not uh copy uh his well, his stuff on that uh, sorry yeah, go well on. you know what well, you know what they say uh better stolen right than, than invented wrongly or something i don't know how you say <laughs> it in english <laughs> but yeah it makes sense you, there is a trick to it which is uh because in a way the same with the traction book it it offers best business practices but they are put it very well together so the diff the difficulty because we've got people now that try to copycat what we are doing but if you imitate something just from the outside without understanding it from the inside, you still get a very poor result. So I have nothing against copying. Just so, I mean, I'm trying to not to work with this book, so I'm copying someone else's insights. But they only become valuable if you make them yours. So even if you were to copy a mission statement or a vision statement from some other organization, you still have to put in the work to make it your own understanding. And then if it ends up using the same words, but you give it your understanding, then I would say that's fine. Now, those are some really wise words, actually. And that's probably why, uh, you know, the likes of Luke and his team and maybe some of the other um, very generous uh you know, business owners and executives out there are really not that worried about this kind of thing. Um, awesome. So yeah. you were you were going on there in terms of uh, you were going on to sort of the marketing strategy side of things. Um, and it's funny because as I'm learning about this, I'm going, oh, that's where you know Luke got so and so from. You know, because they talk about the three uniques. Yeah. Uh, and the proven process. Yes. Uh, just very interesting. That's a guarantee. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What are those for you? What are those for Fit20? The three uniques? Yeah. Well, I mean, we call them uniques. Uh, of course, they're not universally uniques, but they're pretty unique to the market, which is uh, 20 minutes a week, appointment only, and always under supervision. And then actually we have more uniques, but... It depends, again, who you're talking to, which uniques you would emphasize. But generally, it's the fact that it's short, the 20 minutes. It's always an appointment only under supervision. And uh, in our case, because you train in uh, air-conditioned spaces, you don't have to change clothes and you don't sweat. You don't need to shower. So you can slot it in during the day. Yeah, I remember talking to Kieran about that, and I couldn't quite believe it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but but I'm guessing you'll vouch for that as you see it on at scale, right? Happening across the Fit Twenty organization, is that correct? In terms of right. people being quite comfortable training in their clothes. Yeah, yeah. People still find it really weird, and that's why we <laughs> we are still the exotic sort of sort of bungling, strange thing in the fitness industry. Mm. in Holland so we're now one of the bigger players but they still don't get us so they they they, they still think we're weird <laughs> well, I don't think that's such a bad thing um, <laughs> so no. how, how are you implementing a 
what's the proven process look like for Fit20? Sort of high level. Yeah. Um, well, um, actually, it's always um, w- we've tried everything. Um, so then you find out that most things, you know, they, they sound great, but they don't work so well. So if you drill it down, there's a few things that actually always work for our business and therefore they become uh, fundamental to any studio that opens up. And of course, we live in the time of online. So a proven process is that you really work with online marketeers. So we have um, uh, partners with whom every um, franchisee for every studio would have to start up with uh, lead generation, which is where the marketing begins through all the paid uh, campaigns that we run on Facebook. So that really works very well for us. So that's part of a proven process. Uh, What's also proven is to become a member in the business community. So you join, for example, BNI networks. And if there's no BNI chapter in your neighborhood and you look at what kind of, how are the entrepreneurs of this uh, area, how are they organized? Where do they meet up? And you join that. So these are two very um, much identified things that everyone uh, mandatory has to do when they join us. Yeah, this is excellent. I, I just want to pause here because I think this is really good examples about, uh, for this. So, you know, uh, Walt was talking about proven process in respect to how Fit20 deliver results for their customers. Uh, and obviously, one of the key um, uh, things that, uh, you know, a, a, an entrepreneur needs to figure out is how to drive leads and how to convert uh, and acquire customers. Uh, and so, what obviously Walter was laying out there is the approaches they use to ensure results for their customers who are the franchisees. Whereas, you know, looking at it from a studio context, if you look at Discover Strength, their proven process is a uh, is essentially how they take their clients through a journey. Yes. Um, That's and right. obviously a journey in terms of, you know, their workouts, how they then yeah. plan around their goals and meet their needs and then yes. how they, uh, achieve those goals and then reassess. And then the, and it's like a circular motion. They've got a, a thing stamped on the wall of a big, uh, circle made up with arrows and the proven processes is, is there for all to see. And I think they've got an online video I'll link to from the blog post too, but I just wanted to give it for the, for, for the different contexts. Sorry, Walter, yes, right? you're going to no. mention something? It's very, it's very good you add that, Lawrence, because indeed you have the proven process at the level of the, the customer, mm-hmm. at the level of a business owner, and, and at the level of a country. So, so we, we have to actually differentiate three different levels of proven process. And the last bit of the marketing strategy is the guarantee. Um, it's something mm. I'm trying to figure out actually for my own for my online business. Um, as I'm not a big I'm not a big fan just to totally change context for a moment. I'm not a big mm. fan of this free trial stuff when it comes mm. to online um, or, yeah. or $1 trial because sometimes I worry that you'll attract the wrong customer who will be the wrong fit, who yeah. won't necessarily be you know easy to retain or um, easy to manage. And whereas if you say, no, 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 you, know, you pay full price from the beginning, um, you're more likely to attract a more ambitious individual, someone who understands the value and is willing to put in the effort. Um, yeah. And that's kind of my view around the whole like free trial thing. Although I think that totally changes, in my opinion, in yeah. the context of a personal training business where I think it could be very, very valuable to offer a free introductory workout. So I'm obviously talking about two entirely different contexts. Yes. But I'd love to hear your view on the guarantee and how yeah. you know, what guarantee you have for Fit20. Yeah. yeah. Um, for uh, customers, we still hold the one month um, satisfaction. So if people are not satisfied within the first month, they can quit. So we don't. Is that trainees people, or is that franchisees? For the franchisees to their customers. So, so it's really the okay. end customer in the studios, the people that turn up as, as clients. So sometimes. If a person comes for the first time in the studio and they've never done any workouts and they sign up, um, you don't really know yet with who you're signing up. You've seen them once or twice at best. And, and you, even if you like them, you still don't know whether whether the workout will actually work for you. So particularly for people with rheumatism or people with certain health complaints, we said, okay, let, let's tr- 
you have the one month trial, so you sign on. But if you get more problems than, than benefits, then you can cut off your membership. So we won't hold that. So that can kind of relax uh, the client. Um, with the franchisee, it's a different level of guarantee. So we offer um, a franchise, a potential franchise owner up to the point of opening up their studio, there is a way for them to pull out. So my experience is that people don't like it if they're in a room and, and the door is locked up. Everyone relaxes when the door is open. So you always know that I can leave. If you know you can leave, you're less inclined to leave. Um, many fitness uh, centers still work with the idea of a two-year contract um, and then they hold you to it. It actually produces negative publicity and a negative vibe. Um, the way we I've always looked at it is that you don't want to have any negative vibes. You just want to create positive vibes. So we offer those kind of guarantees to uh, match the expectations. But uh, different countries probably need different, different guarantees. We found that in the US, uh, free trials actually it lessens the value proposition. So we do packages there which are priced more attractively and that works very well there. In Holland, we don't need to do that. It's not necessary. So I think there's some differences in terms of countries where, where you want to put the emphasis. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, ARX. Are you looking to create a cutting edge, high intensity training facility are you confused on what equipment to use or how to separate yourself from the masses? Well, then ARX Fit might be the answer you're looking for. I asked Mike Palano from ARX a few questions about how ARX machines are challenging the status quo of the exercise industry around the globe. Mike, if you could, give the listeners a quick summary of why ARX is so different from the traditional machines or tools they're used to seeing in most exercise facilities. ARX is totally different than anything you've seen before. This isn't just another weight stack machine. We've looked at the last 40 years of exercise technology and used that knowledge to create something entirely new. ARX uses a new form of resistance, a motor, and we pair that motor with computer software so that we can maximize the safety, effectiveness, and efficiency of your workouts. So you may be asking, okay, but how does ARX compare to weights? Traditional machines you see in gyms today are based on lifting metal weights and battling gravity. What people don't realize is that when you're forced to lift a static weight like this, one that doesn't adapt or change while you use it, you're underloading yourself rep after rep. And this unnecessarily limits your ability to make improvements. With ARX, we've taken a totally different approach. We removed weights and gravity from the equation altogether. Instead, ARX combines our patented motorized resistance with our custom computer software to provide you with the world's safest, most effective, and most quantified form of resistance training ever. When you train with ARX, you are training to your perfect level of resistance, both positively and negatively 100% of the time. No more guessing what weight to use, ARX does all of that for you, instantly and automatically. We'll also track and measure every second of every rep, so you can quantify all of your workouts to find out if you're improving and by exactly how much. Whether your goals are bigger muscles, increased strength, stronger bones, or just to look good in a bathing suit, ARX can help you achieve all of these and more, but do so in a fraction of the time it would take compared to traditional equipment. If you're looking for the most efficient, most effective, and most quantified piece of exercise equipment on the market today, then look no further than ARX. Thanks, Mike. That all sounds really impressive. If you'd like to learn more about ARX, visit arxfit.com and mention that you heard about ARX on the High Intensity Business Podcast to receive an exclusive deal of $500 of shipping and installation of your ARX machines. And just curious for, again, obviously, I, I like the fact that you're focused on talking about 
um, lessons that are going to be useful to the studio owners. I, I really appreciate that, Walter. Uh, and I, I, I love the fact that you'll take, you'll, you keep bringing me back there, which is really important. But I am just curious, though, with regard to Fit20, who is your, do you have a target market in terms of an ideal franchisee um, or, or master, like what that looks like in terms of that individual and, um, you know, the, yeah. the, the boxes they tick? Yeah. Yeah, for me now, and this is after uh, we're now operating in nine countries. So uh, in terms of new uh, masters that open up a country, in our case, it really is almost mandatory that they've got franchise experience. So if you, um, there's two reasons why a master generally fails. Uh, One of them is they don't understand franchising, which is a, a business unto itself, and they can fail because they run out of cash. So if you don't have an, the required capital to expand a business in a new country, then you will run amok. And the same happens if you don't understand franchising as a business model and you have to still find it out whilst you're trying to build up a country, it adds risk. So we look for professional parties now only for uh, expanding in new countries, particularly if it's further away. Like I mentioned to you that we've got people talking to us from the Philippines, which is roughly the other side of the world. So it is a good feeling for both sides if, if we understand each other. So if they already understand franchise, then implementing Fit20 is relatively easy because I view ourselves as a service provider. We provide a service. It happens to be a physical service, but it's a service. So I've never viewed ourselves as a fitness, but it's a service. Uh, as I a level be... franchise owner, it's very different what we look for. Yeah, so, I, I would be so curious, you know, how you would actually find those types of people because obviously they're a very niche group of individuals those that have successful franchise experience and first thing that came to mind in my head is joining some sort of you know elite mastermind and um, where you're likely to meet those individuals who may be interested i mean obviously you get i'm sure you know we've had interest through the show before and there will yeah. be f- future interest through this podcast because this, this podcast is listened yeah. to by um you know lots of individuals some very high net worth individuals and those who have yeah. vast business experience but yeah. i'm curious you know what have you what methods have you found uh, to help find the right uh, uh, to help connect you with your target market for the fit 20 franchising franchise uh, well i think that's like growing up together like uh, years ago we were we were ourselves a wannabe now people see we are around and we're here to stay and so our our reputation our, our, our credibility is perceived differently so if you take an example in, in Singapore or Malaysia, if you have someone who already runs all the Starbucks operations there or something like that, then uh, at some point they've got their country full up with Starbucks. You know, There's no more Starbucks to go. So then they ask themselves, what shall I do now? And so they will pluck in another franchise. And that's at the moment, um, there is a, a huge interest into preventative health. Uh, and well-being. So I think Fit20 fits in there. And so we attract interest now from parties that I couldn't predict even one or two years ago. Right. So these are effectively, so I, just so I understand this correctly, these are typically serial franchise, yeah. franchise well, we call, or franchisees. We call them, <laughs> exactly, we call them multi-franchise owners. Well, that's so right. you, okay. So you can run multiple brands, And in in the US, that's already fairly common, where you've got entrepreneurs who run, who are only masters, so they are original developers, they only run franchise businesses and and they they are excellent operators. So they execute. So they don't look to create and invent. They just look for brands that already have done that. And they are very good at how to actually roll that out. And uh, so for a master, that's what you look at for someone with operational excellence. Yeah, this is, uh, you're starting to um, make me think of maybe five, 10, 15 years forward where, where I might take my own career. So I'm, <laughs> I, this is really interesting stuff to me. Um, mm. Awesome. So 
let's uh, let's I guess move on to the next section. I know that again we could. Yeah. I, I, I guess I also take this moment to say, you know, what obviously Walter and I are going through in terms of traction. It's really a you know a, a workbook or, or um, a process which you guys listening, business owners, the operators need to go through yourself. You'll need to go through the questions and the scorecards and the processes and everything. Um, and hopefully this will just give you a nice insight into what uh, it entails and, and to give you some context in, in, in how, you know, Walter and I might think about answering some of these questions. So shall we move on to data? Data, yeah, KPIs. Yeah. Yeah. But that's really an area which we were really neglecting seriously. And um, uh, something that we caught up much too late, actually, if I look back, because we were so much busy with creating that we're not really seriously paying attention to data. But, of course, everything is shifting to what they call these days data-driven decision-making. Um, so you need to have your data. So we look to it at the level, if we took, for instance, if we look at studio level, we look to how many leads, how many uh, leads do you have? So how many people are potentially interested to come for, say, uh, an introductory training? Then you look to how many of those convert. Then you look to how many of them stay around and for how long exactly, so the retention. Then can we just pause? Can we just pause on that for a moment, Walter? Because sorry to interrupt sure. your flow. Um, in terms of the retention, this is an interesting one because I, I personally find this quite challenging to understand. As I know that it's one of those ones where it's not measured that well in this industry. Um, you know, people get things like attrition and churn kind of confused. So how how do you uh, advocate your franchisees measure retention? Uh, we, we literally, we do measure how long a client sticks. So we have an average of 22 months. That's wow. the average lifespan of a customer. But we see that actually that's the average. So you've got people who stay shorter and you've got people who stay for years. Our longest clients are over 10 years with us and they will never leave. So you've got, I always say you've got two types of clients, those who come and go and those who come and stay. And uh, the longer a studio exists, the longer the base of people who've come and stay grows. So effectively, you get more and more of a stable base. But because we do more and more online, you get different sources of your clients. So it's very interesting to monitor. Uh, obviously, the word of mouth is still by far the number one, not only bringer of new members in studios, but also tends to be produced to people who stay the longest. If you get Facebook leads, uh, it's easy come, easy go. So, um, but not all of them. So this is where it gets really fuzzy and where I think we need to have steps to make in our own data analyzing. Because within the Facebook leads, some of them actually do stay for years. And this is where we still have too much of a black hole ourselves of what then is the difference in the Facebook. So my guess is, but I can't back that up with data yet, so this is why we're working with this right now ourselves, is that when people are stimulated by content, free content that we put on Facebook, and they respond, then there is an intrinsic motivation. If they get pushed because they see an ad fly by on their Facebook timeline, they may respond, but then it may be more impulse driven rather than it has an innate interest in them. So this is where we will go further and further ourselves to put that into the data analyzing that we can do. So just a, a quick summary on those then. So the key key KPIs is number of leads generated, number of leads converted, um, re, uh, retention uh, metrics, uh, and then... Sources. Sources. Excellent. Um, and sources of leads, is that? That's right. Because yeah. that's interesting for us to see. Where do people come from? How have they found us? How do they know about us? So we can uh, build more and more track record of which where we should put our marketing euros um, and where not. What is the yeah? What does the ranking look like at the moment? When you look at all of your studios, what is the the ranking in terms of you know? Is it like is it referrals at the top and then Facebook and then BNI yeah. and how does that rank? Do you yeah, have that data? Yeah, that's roughly roughly like that. Oh, <laughs> so, so the first thing is five clients members bring members. 
which we also stimulate actively. So you can do internal marketing promotions. So at the moment, because we exist for 10 years, we did something which really caused a lot of response, which is uh, we exist for 10 years. So if you bring a client now, uh, you, we offer you five weeks for free and, you, and the person you bring also gets five weeks for free, 10 in total, 10 years. So that's a oh, one-time okay. promotion we did and that brought a huge amount of new members. Excellent. So, that's a very interest, That's a very useful tactic that people can take away. Yeah. So also the members, because very often with promotion, it's the new people that benefit, but not the existing clients. But it's the existing clients that pay your bills. So uh, you want to do something that, that your existing client base benefits from. So it, it's the members number one, it's uh, Facebook number two, and it's uh, business networks number three. These are the three main ones. And then you get a fourth category, which is all sorts of things, including still old-fashioned offline things like uh, flyers or joint partnerships with other shops or hairdressers or um, clothing shops, you know, you can, whatever you can think of. But these are in the number four category. And I know I, know I interrupted you earlier, and apologies for that, uh, when you were going through the different uh, the data uh, aspects of data. Um, w- was there any more that you wanted to mention on that? That things that you're tracking from on a studio level? No, these ones we we track because normally you can see with um, a good studio, you can always recognize that they have a high conversion rate from leads to c- customers, and their retention levels are high. So it, it's always very easy to to look at studio health and recognize the retention and both the the amount of leads because the leads give you an idea of what kind of activity levels going on in the studio and if the conversion isn't good then you can drill down on who was the trainer how does that trainer convert so we look to conversion at trainer level so we know that so and so converts very well and another person may convert very poorly or not well enough what's going wrong why not and then you have that kind of dialogue. Yeah, and that's the whole point, obviously, of these metrics, isn't it? It's being able to, to glance at those metrics and get an idea of the health of your business. Um, and then you can work out what needs to be addressed in some of those other areas. You know, it's yes. interesting talking about conversions. And you know, I remember Luke saying to me that at Discover Strength, they tested um, moving the sales function to a select group of people within the team. Um, who they thought might be better at that role and the conversions skyrocketed um, mm. because obviously they had, well, I'm assuming greater sales proficiency than, you know, other personal trainers. Um, so they now have that as their kind of policy that any new introductory workout only goes via one of these selected salespeople. And that yeah. I believe that it's not just trainers. It's a, it's a group of individuals. Uh, mm. it, it might, I think it might be, um, even one of the leadership team might play that role as well. I'm not sure. Right. Um, I'm just curious, have you, is that, do you have that sort of process set up with Fit20 or um, do all trainers have that responsibility? Well, uh, when a franchise starts as a business owner with us, actually it starts as a small studio. So they will tend to give most of the introductory trainings themselves. And given that it's their business, they're pretty motivated to convert people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So usually that works out well, but some people are definitely better than others. And um, um, you can then attract, at some point they may get trainers indeed that are better at converting than they are themselves. So if they're a bit of an introvert type personality, then it may just be a little bit harder to connect to, to the potential client when he walks in. And when you have a very outgoing, friendly, you know, easy to connect with type of trainer, then that trainer might actually convert better. So um, that's okay. Uh, I think that's also what data tells you is do what you're best at. Yeah, excellent. So the next bit is process. And this is something that you know, I talk about so much on the podcast in terms of, you know, the importance of having systems and processes in your business. And it's something that I, you know, really passionate about in, in my business and, you know, making sure that I'm, when I'm 
running the business that every single action is done the same way every time and also refined and improved over time. Um, yeah. And that's essentially what I understand this to be. So I don't know, do you want to give your overview yeah. of the process aspect in within Traction? Yeah. Yes, I think uh, so. Process is the way your business works. And one of the great things in, in the book, uh, those of you who will buy it, is page 152. So I'm doing some promotion here. But uh, all processes in business are, are highly similar. So you've got uh, the human resource process. How do you actually fire, find, hire, if necessary, fire uh, people that you attract? The marketing process, the sales process, your operations, so all the supporting systems, your accounting process, all the financials, and then the sixth one is customer retention process. So when I saw that, um, actually I thought, yeah, I mean, this, this, this I can work with this, uh, very recognizable, and I think it's recognizable in, in many types of industries. So the processes are... 80% uh, relevant for whatever business you have. I think where, where for me uh, it was very important to read this is who is doing which part of the process. And this is where I think uh, with us there were, uh, there's a lot of improvement to be made is the accountability. So who is doing what? And once you have the processes identified, then you can select who will be accountable, responsible for a process. And then you can um, describe the tasks underneath that. So we're in the midst of doing that and it's incredibly clarifying and it also brings um, a level of clarity in the organization that we didn't have in the beginning. When we were a startup, everybody was doing everything and we covered for each other. But you can only do it for so long before that really turns counterproductive. So for me, uh, the processing and the, the accountability has been one of the most meaningful parts so far of working with this uh, book. Yeah, awesome. Now, I, I know the next bit is traction, but do we skip over that to go to issues? Does it make more sense to do yeah. that and then come back issues. to traction? Yeah. Sure, sure. <laughs> yeah, we got lots of issues. So uh, <laughs> You and I both. <laughs> So issues is anything that actually goes beyond what you can fix within a quarter. So um, that really also gives it a place. So there are things that just will take uh, longer to solve, whether it's a technological challenge or to implement something new. Um, but by making it an issue or we use before we called it projects ourselves, but when you have a project, the difficulty of projects or issues is that they are not defined enough and you need to have someone who's actually responsible for that particular issue. So this is also what we've been uh, doing now. And in that way, um, it's not all the time a kind of stressor, but you know, yes, this is an issue we, we recognize it's identified. It's clear who's responsible for it and there's regular reporting on its progress. So that really helps us live with our, say, unfinished uh, or imperfect aspects of the business. Excellent. And the next section is people. Have you? I don't think we've covered that in yeah. kind of an overview of that, have we? Yeah. It's a very simple thing, they say, but not so easy to implement. They say you need to have the right people and they need to be in the right seat. And that's the essence of people. So if you don't have the right people, and that's something I definitely found out. We're only working with 18 people in our core team. Everyone really needs to be committed for 100%. And if someone isn't, it sort of stands out. And it doesn't gel with the type of company that we are. But you can have the right person, but are, are they doing what they are naturally best at? So are they in the right seat? So also by going through the accountability uh, chart, it helps us to really sometimes put people in different uh, responsibilities and, and they immediately become much happier. Yeah, right person, right seat is a, a big factor for the success of any business, let alone a high intensity training business for sure. Um, something again that, that Luke has really drilled into my head. Um, 
Mm-hmm. And just bringing it back then to traction, and which is really, yeah. I guess, bringing this all down to the ground and uh, implementing it in the real world. And do you want to just elaborate on that exactly? Yeah. So the first thing we did, uh, so we already have our plan for 2020 in place for, for worldwide, as well as at country level. So that's a one-year plan. And uh, the one-year plan needs to be really uh, fully documented. So we have two very simple ingredients to that, which is studio growth and member growth. And uh, then we can anticipate when we will need, for instance, an extra support employee or when we will need an additional online marketeer or when we will need an additional IT specialist. So by actually drilling it very much into the detail in a one-year plan, we are also fairly accurate. That's the great thing of traction. It makes your business more predictable. And I think many beginning businesses, if they are anything like ours, you are good on the vision and bad on the traction. And as a business gets more mature, you can see that the vision and the traction begins to be more balanced. So uh, our shareholders want to see that um, at the end of the year, um, it's okay if you can say we, d- we did 90% of our one-year plan in terms of profit and losses, but it's not so good if you did 75% because then your plan was not so accurate. So I think it's taken us the last two years and and now working with Traction really helps to put a one-year plan much more in focus and in detail so that the realistic aspect of growing the business is getting more and more aligned. Mm -hmm. And I'm just looking at one of the worksheets here and so you've got um, the one-year plan and then you're up up to seven goals for the year. But as we talked about earlier, probably less is more and it might be better to have less than seven in most cases, at least for me. Um, And then you've got your quarterly rocks, um, Rocks, which are your 90-day goals that obviously lead to the one-year goals. Um, and then your issues list, which we mentioned earlier on the, um, yeah. the issues section of this. So, um, you know, I know that Walter and I have kind of zipped through the second half of this, but it's uh, it's probably more productive um, for people to actually go through the book uh, yeah. and maybe go through some of the online presentations. I'll link to as many valuable resources that I can find um, yeah. in the blog post to this. Um, as I think you really have to go through the process and I'm absolutely 100% going to be going through this for um, my online business, for high intensity business um, and also for uh, the studio that I opened with Sean in early 2020. Um, right. So we'll, we'll be, yeah, we'll be going through because I think this is a wonderful structure and uh, framework, absolutely. I should say. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, I did the scorecard, Walter, for my own, uh, for high intensity business. And I got a pathetic 39 out of 100. And to be honest, I was probably, I was probably being quite generous to myself. <laughs> oh, well, I gave myself 53 here. But uh, right. my colleagues probably were more positive honest. about our business. So that's good <laughs> Excellent. So just a couple more things quickly I just wanted to uh, discuss. So, you know, this is something that, you know, forgive me, Walter, if we talked about this on our first podcast, which I, I can't remember because it was so long ago. Um, yeah. But I, I I thought this was one of the things that kind of came up for me as I was reading Traction. And in fact, I was having a phone call with someone yesterday who is um, uh, a new high intensity training business owner and looking to, to try and grow their business. Um, and they were asking me, you know, why hasn't this taken off? Why isn't high intensity training more ubiquitous? You know, why is it still wow. so so niche? And I'm pretty sure you and I have talked about this before. Um, but I just mm. wanted to revisit that for a minute. Um, and my yeah. response to that person was twofold. I firstly said, and I, I've, I stole this from probably Doug McGuff, um, which is that it's just so difficult. You know, it's it requires effort, it requires discipline, it requires hard work. You know, when when the study from Simon Milov came out that showed strength training reversed aging, you know, Doug expected uh, everyone to hit the gym uh, and start doing strength training, and actually, that is not what happened. Um, no. 
and, and that's the and that's his his prediction as to why in, in that it just requires a great deal of you know discipline and effort to do it so that's the first point and the second one and you know it's maybe uh i know this is perhaps a sensitive thing to say but i feel like you know, a lot of the business owners in high intensity training maybe need to be a little bit more humble and and develop their business acumen. Um, as I as I feel like it's uh, yeah. the business acumen needs some work, uh, and you yeah. can see that those that are successful um, and achieve their goals really seem to be open minded and uh, willing to. Uh, implement things like um, you know getting things done and yeah. um, traction which I know the perfect workout implement both and again discover strength implement all sorts of systems and it's it's this different mindset towards systems and um, you know building the business as opposed to you being integral to the business running which is a trap in the long term yeah. um, and so I feel like it's it's really a, a lot of the people, probably a lot of people listening to the show, perhaps need to revisit yeah. the business principles. Yeah. So that's my theory: yeah. is that it's twofold. Yeah. So what what do you make of that? Okay, well I, I pretty much can go along with that. Um, the, uh, let's begin with um, some kind of comfort to everyone. I always hear that if if your business would be easy, then everybody would be doing it. So then you would have a huge competition. So maybe that's on the upside that uh, sometimes we should all be glad that it's difficult. (laughs) I love that. But having said that, um, I've been wondering myself, pondering this question, of course, many, many times, how come that that it's still so uh, not mainstream? I think it's changing slowly, but I think there are, are two factors. One of them, I think, um, our master training says actually it's easier to run a marathon than train really to muscle failure on six machines consecutively. And there is something, if you look to purely intensity of effort, um, that is evolutionary, I think, still wired in the brain as, as producing a lot of resistance to actually do that. So I think there is literally uh, running on a treadmill is just so much easier than really training to failure. So I think there is that, which is simply not sexy, not easy. And it requires, therefore, a very different kind of thought leadership that when you engage with your customer, you need to explain a lot more and not just once, but in a way every week. And that's a little bit unfair because if you just open up a fitness center and you chunk it full with all kinds of machines, cardio machines, you don't have to explain anything ever after. (laughs) So (laughs) there is that. And I think we just have to accept that and in a way embrace it because that's a fact and we have to adapt to that and just become better at explaining why if you're 40 year plus year old and you're going to do one thing for your health, strength training is the way to go. Um, well, at Fit20, it's undisputed for us based on scientific evidence and insight that that's what you should do. If a person has more time and energy to spare and they want to also go cycle or running or swimming, whatever, fine. But if you're going to do one thing, only it should be strength training so i think that puts upon us in the hit industry just a higher demand on being able to educate uh, and keep educating our clients and the second thing which we still struggle with particularly because we only say once a week 20 minutes is enough is of course that creates a lot of skepticism and critique Um, Or you get kind of pitiful statements like, you know, I guess doing something is better than nothing. Um, No, and then I say, all right, well, do one time that, you know, something better than nothing with me for 20 minutes and and let's have a conversation after that, how you feel about it. (laughs) Because (laughs) when I did the first time a real workout uh, with six machines to fill you, I mean, I didn't know what the hell happened to me. It, it sort of was worse than anything I ever experienced. 
in a good your way. Body, <laughs> <laughs> it really hits you so 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 deep in the body that then immediately then I knew this I'm onto something. So I think we just this is something we just have to to do with everyone active in the hit industry. We just have to don't give up on on educating customers that this is really the way to go. And the difficulty is that you can, if you just go say on the treadmill, you can you can sort of go on it and give it sixty percent of what you've got, and you just sweat a little bit. It feels nice, but you haven't created a training stimulus that's going to really radically rejuvenate your body on the inside at cellular level, which training to failure does. Uh, so we have this kind of work out, which is every time hell. And uh, yeah, that requires therefore more education to keep the motivation to keep doing it. I've seen clients stop with us who got fantastic results, but they couldn't stomach it. And um, that's the thing. So uh, then we also learned that you can't train everyone to the pure land. You know, you have to be able to, to business-wise also sometimes say, okay, if you do three exercises to fill you and three sort of 70%, you still get overall very good benefit. And I think this is where we have to become business savvy as well, because otherwise we just face a difficult future. Yeah, I think that's really smart. And clearly... You kind of said there that the reasons why it hasn't exploded is is multivariate. You know, it's it's, it's a lot of things happening there, um, and you know, one of the things I've always interesting is is like you say they're meeting people where they are. You know, um, adapting a, or flexing a training program down so there's less exercises. Maybe accepting that they won't all go to failure um, is 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 part of that. Now, do you think? Do you think that, you know, it sounds like what you're saying, though, is that there is always going to be, it's, li it's likely, um, certainly in the next 10 years, perhaps, um, that this is always going to be a niche market and a, well, a I minority. Don't, I don't think, no, I'm yeah. actually very positive and optimistic about the future. Uh, I was talking to a guy from Singapore and he says, wow, this workout is exactly what will fit the Asian market. And I actually uh, increasingly think so, too. Uh, people there work even much more hours than we do in the West generally. They work 60, 70 hours standard. So uh, they don't have the time to go and work out three times a week for an hour. They just don't have the time. Um, there's increasingly a huge market there, but also in the West, where where people really are prepared to do this. But I do think we, we do need to help people understand why they should do this and why they should keep doing it. So one of the things I think as an ultimate goal for all of us to achieve is that doing strength training and particularly HIIT training as the superior strength training, it needs to become like brushing your teeth. You just do it. You, know, you yeah, don't skip drop. a day brushing your teeth <laughs> because you don't feel like it. You just do it. And um, you, you know that you, everyone basically does that. So we need to get... Um, the high intensity training, we need to get it in people's minds. That's what we try to do with our customers. We say, you know, coming here once a week needs to be like brushing your teeth. Yeah, I love that analogy. Um, awesome. Walter, this has been a great conversation as always. Um, and, and hopefully we can maybe do a, a, a another part or maybe a, a couple parts on uh, talking more about attraction. I know that um, Luke's perhaps keen to come on the show too. Maybe we can do a free freeway podcast, who knows, um, yeah. you know, in, in, in 2020 to talk about this more. Um, Great. And, you know, for everyone listening, what is the best way for people to find out more about your organization and if they're interested, how they can learn more about starting a Fit20 franchise? Oh, thanks for asking. Um, at fit20.com. Um, people find us at the international level and uh, then they can see which countries we're active, which nine countries we are, and if they should be interested to f explore the possibility of starting a studio in one of those nine countries we're active at the moment, then uh, you can find it via fit20.com. 
Excellent. And we obviously have a worldwide listener base, but um, you know, probably 70, 80% of the people are in the US. And what's the domain if you're just looking for uh, a US-based franchise? Well, that's a great thing. In principle, all of the US. Um, we just opened up in Michigan and Virginia, but we're talking to Utah, Nevada, Kansas, uh, Florida. Uh, so I think there's still 45 states to go or something, and they're all welcome. And and which is which website do they go to? Just fit20.com or somewhere else? Fit20usa.com. Right, got it. Okay. Um, awesome. Thank you for that. And we'll link to that in the show notes if you missed that. And the show notes will be over at um, highintensitybusiness.com forward slash... Uh, 250 or you can just search for episode 250 on the blog Um, and also I just want to mention you know we've been talking about a lot of the high level stuff from traction and the entrepreneur operating system which again just to highlight this is something that is proven across multiple industries and specifically in high intensity training business it really does seem to be the way to go you know the perfect workout um, use it, discover strength, use it, fit 20 using it. I'm sure there are others who are using it too. Um, and over in the membership, in Hit Business membership, I've actually expanded on a lot of the um, things that you need to execute, like the meeting strategy, marketing plans, uh, the proven process, all of the various bits that make up traction um, are explored in the membership. Should we show you how to execute on that in a Hit Business context? And I've partnered with discover strength and other experts in here to really dive into the the details of how you go about implementing those in your business for for maximum results and so if you're interested in that please go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash membership um and that's it so walter thanks so much for your time today really appreciate it it was hugely enjoyable lawrence thank you <laughs> as, as always um and for everyone listening once more to find the blog post for this please go to highintensitybusiness.com forward slash 250 and until next time thank you very much for listening discover how to achieve your health and fitness goals become a great personal trainer and build a successful high intensity training business check out highintensitybusiness.com highintensitybusiness.com This episode is brought to you by the Resistance Exercise Conference. Would you like to learn from the top strength training professionals and researchers, network and connect with other exercise professionals from all over the world, and get inspired, rejuvenated, and focused on your strength training business? I certainly do, and that is why this will be my third appearance at REC. It's my favorite weekend of the year, and I'm so excited to attend again in March 2020. So why else should you attend REC? Well, firstly, there will be keynote presentations from exercise icons like Dr. Bente Klarlin Peterson, Stuart Phillips, PhD, James Fisher, PhD, and Luke Carlson. As a studio owner, you will learn business tactics and strategies on how to grow your business from the CEO of Discover Strength, the highest revenue producing strength training company in the nation. Moreover, you will grow your network by connecting with other strength training business owners from around the world. As a personal trainer, REC will provide you with tangible training techniques to take back to your clients to implement right away for better results. And REC is approved by ACSM, NASM, ACE, and NSCA for continuing education credits. The conference will be held on the 27th and 28th of March 2020 at the gorgeous Graduate Hotel in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Join me and register now over at resistanceexerciseconference.com. If you want to take your strength training business to the next level and build a world-class personal training and business network, you must attend. Please register now over at resistanceexerciseconference.com. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. 
The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention HIB, that's high intensity business, in the how did you hear about us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you place an order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter HIB in the how did you hear about us field. 